Can everybody hear me okay if I'm here or do I need to have it closer? I think you need to have it closer. Okay. <laughs> Okay, so I'm Floyd Bias Mintz and I'm the chair of the board and we're going to call the meeting to order uh, week 19 on April 10th, 2024. We're very excited to be at Calas and to be live here with all of you. And then we have, uh, before I do some welcome remarks, I'm going to do some adjustments to agenda so everybody has a little bit of an idea of what we're going to be doing today and then we'll welcome our guests. So we, I don't know if the board has any adjustments to the agenda, but I want to suggest a couple uh, to add a 4.2 for board competitions on the budget, and then a 4.3 to appoint a board member to the principal search committee for you 32. We also want to reference the warning, didn't we? Approve the budget and the, and the warning. That's part, of, that's part of the budget on page four. So we just got an approved one, and so that would be our third point for discussion and action. Okay, could I have a motion to accept the agenda as amended? Thank you, Ursula. And second, I see a hand down there, but I, oh, there, Michelle. Did we get that, Lisa? Right. So those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Seeing no, the motion carries. So welcome. Everybody, I want to start today to just sort of describe what makes an effective school board and how do we build hope or a framework and hold ourselves as hope builders and build possibilities and create the environment that we want to see here uh, today. So I brought, um, I just came back from the National School Board's meeting. And there's always a lot of lectures and resources, so I brought some lessons for everybody. So I'm going to pass them to both sides. I hope you guys don't have that many uh, there. And I thought we would take just a, a minute of the board, even before we get into public comment, to just, uh, you know, remind ourselves of what are good, uh, good habits and some ineffective habits as a school board. So if you would indulge me, I just want to just try to keep this off being ineffective today. So uh, disregard for agenda process and change of command, confusing the roles with those of the superintendent and the staff, nitpicking, micromanaging, playing to media, focusing on personal interests, having interpersonal conflict with other board members or staff, committed to limited time or opportunity to improve governance, and not respecting the leadership of the district. Those are ineffective ways for us to be uh, an effective school board. And some characteristics of effective school board members, which we are really good at being too, is to commit to a vision of high expectations for student achievement and quality of instruction and define clear goals towards a vision, which we have been doing. I'm not gonna read all of them, but I wanted to, you know, cause I know you guys are, in, I, I know you guys would do a lot of uh, governance uh, learning together, uh, but I just wanted to remind us today what in effective school board meeting to put our heads and trying to be as best as we can effective leaders uh, today. And let's try to be a, a, a team and lead as a united team. It was a graphic that was very telling. I'm not going to put it out. Mark and I were trying to showed this video, but it was not working, but they also put up a, a graphic that show like a school board on the top of the precipice and you know, holding a rope and there are like sharks on the bottom and there's uh, crocodiles on the bottom. And, and the, the rope is trying to, you know, spit away, but by all of us pulling together as their students, we would be able to stay in mission of what is best. And I know that we're all here, including the public here for what is best for students. So with that, I'm gonna move us into by yourself, 
your comments should be kept to two minutes, uh, depending on how many people are here. Uh, we might be able, we have quite a bit of people, we have 73 participants online, so I think we can go beyond two minutes. Uh, comments should be respectful and, and civil. Be curious, not furious. Regulate and rather than debate, listen and hear not to listen to hear not to respond. Acknowledge knowledge, build up rather than tear down, and challenge ideas and don't attack people. Mm -hmm. So with that, we're gonna open it to public uh, comments and, like I said, strictly the time is strictly enforced just as the board can do its work tonight. So if there's any member in the public here present that wants to make a comment, please raise your hand. Okay, we have two, please come. Well, oh, Stephen has the mic. And then we'll go online and I see one hand already. Good evening. Board members, you received a letter from me last Tuesday and then heard from you again the following night expressing how such a large cut to art would negatively affect our students and our art program. To be clear, I do understand the difficult situation we are in and the need for reductions. I wish there were none, but unfortunately, that's not realistic. My point tonight is that shaving away 0.8 FTE from art is too much and will damage our art program. Even though the proposals from our leadership team states that no services will decrease with this cut, I'm here to say that they will. Yes, I can technically teach all of my students in 45 minute classes, but with a reduction of 0.8 FTE, we will be spread so thin that we risk burnout, we will have little time to prep and clean up, and our students will not have the same opportunities that they have now. That to me, is a decrease in services. Please consider no more than a 0.4 reduction to our FTE. It will be more equitable across our teaching staff and buildings, and more importantly, we will be able to maintain a high quality art program for our students. Thank you. Thank you. Larry. Hello everybody, my name is Larry Gilbert. I'm from East Montpelier. I sent you an email uh, this week uh, uh, asking you to reject the 8% uh, proposal that's in front of you, I believe, or will be in front of you shortly, and to go with something around 5% instead. Three reasons for that. I just want to um, reiterate. Uh, num number one, I just think it's too much of a tax burden on too many people in this, uh, in this district. Um, I think you should do everything you can to minimize that. Number two, um, I don't want to be in the same position uh, five weeks from now that so many other districts are in getting a, having to do another revote because of the, the budget was rejected. Five percent is a is a a small increase, a large decrease from what you're talking about, but I think it is appropriate in these circumstances. And thirdly, and perhaps most importantly, um, I'm hopeful that in a few weeks, we will be having a community-wide discussion about what you guys are calling uh, reconfiguration and consolidation. And I don't think that you can expect um, the voters of any community to say, yes, it's okay to close our school it, unless uh, they believe that the budget has been as streamlined as much as it possibly can before that. So those are the um, three reasons that I have for uh, suggesting the 5%. Uh, just two other very uh, smaller mi minor items. Number one, um, the survey that was uh, compiled by so many of the uh, people that um, uh, participated in that survey talked about communication. I believe, I feel like you guys have not done a great job about communication about the budget. My, uh, I believe there was one public um, uh, pronouncement between last week's meeting and this one, and all it was was a notice on Facebook saying, hey, there's a meeting at 6.15. And I don't think, given the, uh, the circumstances that we're in, that that's the kind of communication that the people of this, this district um, need or want. So as we move forward into the much more difficult thing of selling a new school, uh, budget, um, communication must be better. So towards that end, just one quick thought. This is the budget, 
the document that was circulated to to all the towns about about the sorry your time is up sorry i think that this would be a really good time to give people a little bit of slack i have one more point floor i'll sit okay. down if you make me okay but, it's okay go ahead i but, see that we just have three hands so we're gonna it's kind of an important meeting tonight so um just one just one very quick thought so uh in this budget it says for instance under expenses instructional service it says salaries small item nine million dollars okay i as a voter would love to know a little bit more about that how many teachers is that how many staff is that what kind are they one year two years have they been serving uh serving the district for 30 years that makes it that makes a big difference and here's my favorite one here it says um miscellaneous benefits it's only a small three million dollar item okay when you're doing a budget miscellaneous is for the little stuff Miscell uh, three million dollars is nothing miscellaneous about that and so more detail on that those two items and really all of these other items i think would be appropriate thank you thank you larry okay we have two people in line kyle go ahead oh oh Holly. sorry kyle i Ali was before you. Ali, go ahead and unmute yourself. Can you hear me? Barely. See me? All right, I'll do my best. Um, hi, I'm Ali Mayany, and I've been teaching and managing two libraries in our district. Hold on one minute, Ali, because we can barely hear you. Hold on one okay. minute. And can you stop the timer too? Can you hear me now, Mark? Yes. Is that better? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Can you restart? Uh, I'm uh, Allie Mayany, and I spoke last week. Um, I've been teaching and managing two libraries in our district for six years. I would like to speak a little more about the importance of school libraries and the impact of reducing the library program on students to only two on students if we have only to only two days a week in our smallest school sorry and the impact of reducing the library program on students if uh, if our program is only two days a week in our smallest school there's a big difference in a library and media services when you have a librarian in your building five days a week regardless of the number of students you have when a school library is open only two days a week, students lose access to the just right book at the just right moment. It takes time to get to know the students, their interests, their reading levels, to gain their trust. There's a lot of time that goes into knowing and building a library collection so that it represents everyone's interests and needs. And you have to have the right books for the students in the building, and that is ever changing. School library impact studies, which represent two decades worth of research conducted in multiple states, consistently show a positive correlation between the literacy achievement of students who attend schools with full-time professional school librarians and have well-stocked libraries compared to students whose schools do not have access to such resources. When a school library is open only two days a week, management is a big headache books can go missing and they are misplaced this makes the online catalog less accurate and frustrates both students and teachers there's less time to work with community volunteers who help shelve and keep a space organized when a librarian is only in a building two days a week it makes integrating research and technology skills into classrooms and other collaboration nearly impossible Students and teachers don't only have library media needs on certain days. They need the right book at the right moment. They need help with their computers or learning platform in the moment. Small schools do cost more to operate, but it doesn't mean that students in these schools deserve less because of their zip code. All students deserve daily access to their school library and an updated diverse collection of books. Thank you for letting me speak about my experience. Thank you, Ali. Hey, Kyle. Thanks, Laura. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Yes. So I, I couldn't believe when I saw that all the proposals 
included every cut that was made that was proposed last year and rejected after there was enormous public comment from all five of the communities about the importance of keeping librarian positions for all the reasons Ali just mentioned, nurses, art, and the Spanish program at Rumney. And it, these three proposals are all incredibly problematic because they contain those cuts. Um, some people have been, I looked at the notes from the last meeting, there was discussion about whether you could do a la carte. You are the board, you are our elected officials. We expect you to do a la carte, not just take the three options that were brought to you, options that the communities resoundingly told you a year ago were not acceptable. I have three kids in the schools, one in the Rumney, one in the middle school at U32, one in high school. The most important parts of their education have been the Spanish program at Rumney, the art teachers, the librarians, the nurses, the roles they play in our schools go way beyond what shows up on a spreadsheet. I have a very specific proposal. I think it's the only proposal parents would actually accept. That's that you add back in the Spanish, the art, the nurse, the librarian cuts that are proposed to be made in the 10% proposal. The total of that is $274,000. Take that money from the fund balance. You're still way less than the amount taken from the fund balance in the other proposals. And then you keep what keeps our schools relevant and meaningful. Please make that change. Thank you, Kyle. And we have Hani. Hi, everybody. Can you hear me OK? Okay, yes. excellent. Um, as you discussed and shared the options in the reconfiguration report, you asked, is there a full-time nurse and counselor? Listing it as a configuration priority. Okay, the board meeting on January 17th, you amended the school budget to include full-time nursing and counseling in all schools. Do you continue to stand by the need for full-time nursing and counseling in all schools? I'm speaking directly to the cuts proposed to our two smallest schools. This is on page nine of your packet. Please note that there are additional cuts beyond page eight. It's a little unclear. You have like page eight is beautiful and it shows cuts, but there's more on page nine and they're directly affecting our small schools. Lower enrollment at these schools does not mean lower need for everything that our counselor and nurses provide. In addition to their assigned roles, they act as social workers. They coordinate outside mental health care providers for families. They collaborate with outside mentoring programs to support students. Plus, they work together to meet the basic needs of students, including clothes, shoes, food. Please remember that you set this priority and the community has echoed the priority. I'm going to go off script from my own what I wrote earlier to also say that this process is so hard on so many levels and I can speak for myself to say I spend so much time thinking about what I want to share with the board and I pour my heart into it and I share it and I get a nod and a thank you and it's really hard that there's not more connection with the board more back and forth um, I'd love to ask about you know why we're not cutting transportation costs over nurses when you said last week, we know we can cut two routes and we can probably cut more, but we're not looking to move that into the first column. So um, thank you for your time again. Again, this is a hard process and I appreciate the chance to share my thoughts. Thank you, honey. Yeah, I see one more hand up. Dina, yeah, they, please introduce yourselves, Dina. Are you there? Am I saying that name correctly? Yes, I'm here. I'm so sorry. Hold on. It's a glitch okay. on my phone. Hi, right. guys. I'm, um, I'm Dina Brown, and I am currently a paraeducator at Callis Elementary School. And I was going back and forth about if I felt um, 
good enough to come on and talk. And in my heart, I feel it's really important that as a employee, as a parent, and as an educator and a taxpayer of this wonderful town we live in, I feel that this is scary, just like Ainsley said the other day, with all the cuts that could take place. And what the scary part about it is the quality of care that the children are going to not get because everything's going to be rushed and pushed away. And when you think about good education, you think about Vermont, actually. Um, we currently moved here from California four years ago. And the school system in California is not as progressive as everybody thinks it is. It's 37 kids per class. There's no art. Science is maybe once a week. Uh, PE is cut down to once a week. And you know who's actually performing those duties are parents. Uh, the dedicated parents that do believe that the quality of care is really important. And I feel as a select board, you guys have a duty to prove to us that you guys can be more creative in coming up with ideas to save our beautiful community and the education that we provide our community. And I really want you guys to think with your hearts, not your minds, but your hearts to think what's the best for our children and our future children that we have here in our, in our community. Thank you. Thank you, Dina. We have Catherine. Hi, my name's Catherine Dodge and I'm a student at Casa Elementary School. I just wanted to say we rely on the support of our counselor, and I just feel that we really need our librarian and our art teacher because they just, they help us so much with not only tech issues, but helping us learn more skills. And I just really think it would make them so sad to just cut them. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. Hey, have one. Mila, did I say that right? Can you introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Mela. I'm a 10th grader at U32. I just wanted to say it's really important to me to not cut library services. Um, today, I was a part of, I was one of the student ambassadors for Teen Lit Mob, which was an amazing event we helped to host at U32 with students from all across Vermont, um, supporting libraries, talking about books, meeting authors. It was a really amazing experience for me. I got to meet lots of other kids. And I just want to say the librarians always help support me um, with my academics and helping meet new people, um, helping me learn a lot through books. So I think it's really important not to cut libraries. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. So anybody else in the public before we move? Okay, we have four more hands. Yeah. Please introduce yourselves. Hi, my name is Ainsley. Um, I am a mother, a teacher, and a community member within this district. Um, I voiced last week that I was disappointed with the creativity of the cuts that you are considering. Allied arts, Romney Spanish, um, counseling, these are all proposals that we as a community member, as community have denied and you as a board have overturned in the past. And so like others, I'm confused why these things are back on the table and we're not thinking about different cuts. Ed quality has come up a lot in this conversation and I would reiterate what others have said, that ed quality is affected by these proposals and that um, equity is, is different than just Calis should have the same as East Montpelier, as Rumney, as U32. Equity is something that I've been thinking a lot, actually, and have been considering in terms of the inequity in cost spendings at the SU level versus our six schools. I think maybe I did my math wrong, but I think the increase at the SU level is 46% when we're considering 10% at our schools. That seems really inequitable. I understand that this is due to an increase of a new position, but I'm curious why we need this position. 
when our enrollment is down, when we have when we're considering a decrease in staffing, why are we needing to add new positions at SU? I value your work and I really appreciate each and every one of you and the effort that you put into this conversation. But I would reiterate that I'm disappointed and that these cuts scare me. I'm worried about the quality of education for my child and the kids in my class. So please reconsider. Thank you, Ainsley. Hi, my name is Callie Weller. I'm a teacher here at Callis Preschool, and I'm a parent of two U32 students along with a resident in the district. I'm here tonight to talk about the 1.0 teaching position at Callis. I would like to ensure that everyone is aware of the ramifications of this cut. Should we lose a teacher based on our dwindling, dwindling population, we will need to combine kindergarten and first grade next year. As a 13-year te veteran teacher of both kindergarten and first grade, I have serious concerns. The difference in curriculum alone should give us pause. First graders are learning to write sentences using verbs, conjunctions, and possessive nouns, while kindergartners are learning to write the matching letter sound that they hear to make a word and identify punctuation. In addition, socially and emotionally, five-year-olds are very different than seven-year-olds. Five-year-olds are noisy, verbal, and active. They learn best through play. Seven-year-olds are quieter, specific, passive, and sometimes tense. They hone in on what they do and practice it over and over again. The learning environments that these two groups of students need to succeed are extremely different from one another. I worry that we will be unable to meet the learning and social emotional needs of our kindergartners and first grade students next year. We often make these cuts based on population dwindling, but it's not what's best for our kids. Thank you. Hello, I'm Tracy Leibowitz. I'm a, a parent and a resident of Middlesex. And um, I just, I've been to a few of these meetings now and I'm, I'm, I'm here because my, my family is directly affected by the proposal that nobody has mentioned. It seems like all of the cuts that were included in the original budget that failed are, are just sort of baked in and not up for discussion. And I would just like to know more about what seems like a really significant change that's going to affect the youngest students and it's it's the eliminating the kindergarten program at Rumney and combining the Rumney and Doty pre-k and kindergarten um it, it seems like the propo the proposal on the table is to co combine two years of of those classes one of them being located at Rumney one of them being located at Doty it just seems like a lot of uh instability for for kids that young um, I don't think it makes sense to split the programs up between two locations. I just want to see this board, you know, make make progress towards something that is sustainable. And this just seems to be the opposite of that. I don't know what the plan is um, after those two years. Like, are they just going to go on to first grade and th they're going to be separated? Like, are the Doty kids going to go back to Doty and the Rumney kids going to go back to Rumney? It just... It seems short-sighted. I don't know what the long-term plan is for it. I, I want to hear more information about it. None of it hasn't been discussed at all. Um, so that's my comment. Thank you, Tracy. We had Michael, right? Um, Richard Robertus from East Montpelier. Um, my perspective on this is very different from all the other ones that we've heard tonight, I think, because I am not an insider in the schools. Um, I don't have children in the school. I'm, an, I'm not a teacher or a librarian, but I am a taxpayer. Um, 
my concern about all of the proposals that have been made uh, that are in front of the board now is that they all rely on drawing down money from the fund balance, the reserve fund. Um, to me, that seems like it's not being honest with the taxpayers because all that's happening is you're giving the illusion of reducing the tax increase this year by essentially forcing an, a, an, an even larger tax increase in subsequent years because those funds have to be replenished at some point. Okay, so from my perspective, what you should be doing is in order to be honest with the taxpayers about what you're really spending um, is to consider these uh, reductions, actual spending reductions without the drawdowns on the on the fund balance. And if you take the uh, 6% option that you've got, the actual reduction in spending is not 3 point something million, it's really 2.5 or 2.3. Um, but eliminate the drawdown of the fund balance, that ends up being an increase in the net educational spending of about 8.7%. I think that is much better because it simply doesn't push the problem to the next year where you have to somehow replenish that fund. And that just is baking in, but hiding the fact that there will be larger future tax increases. So I think it would just be, you should be honest with the vote with the voters about what you're really spending. Um, Thank you, Richard. Mike. Okay, anybody else? Seeing none, we're gonna get started with our meeting. Oh, there are two online. Jay Campbell, can you unmute yourself, please? Hi. My name is Jen Campbell. I teach art at Rumney and East Montpelier Elementary School. I just want to let you know that um, some of the ramifications of having 1.4 FTEs, visual arts educators, teaching across five elementary schools are... With the proposed cuts in the art program, we will be teaching up to six art classes per day. If this is the case, the reality is that students will not receive 45 minute classes. With little or no transition time between classes, cleaning up from the previous class will steal class time from the next. Furthermore, having students waiting in the hallway for the previous class to leave because their class ends at the exact same time the next one begins, sets students up for a far from ideal class situation and is not fair to them. Teaching six classes a day will not allow for engaging um, and robust art curriculum, such as offering lessons in a variety of media, clay, sculpture, printmaking, et cetera, and is not sustainable. Teaching six classes a day does not allow for the amount of prep time it takes and the amount of cleanup after these classes. Even the most simplistic form of painting and drawing requires time to be fully prepared for students. Um, with these robust and, um, and engaging art classes, we practice the transferable skills that are really important to our students' graduation. Artistic expression is an SLO. Um, teaching in multiple schools amplifies the difficulty of providing a rigorous curriculum. I just want you to reconsider where you shave and cut and leave the direct student contact programs the way they currently are, including the World Language Program at Rumney. Thank you for the work you're doing. Thank you, Jen. I see we have one more. Talita, do you want to get unmute yourself and introduce yourself? Hi. Um, thanks for listening tonight. Um, I know that Vermont's got an aging population, um, but I keep going back and thinking about how we moved to Middlesex for the school. We loved everything that it had to offer. We visited all sorts of places and schools. And this is why we came here. There have been so many cuts since then, 11 years ago, that I wouldn't actually recommend to friends that they come to my town anymore. And now there's even more being proposed. 
I think of my cousin, my nephew, who lives in Woodstock, Vermont, and his kindergarten class has 50 kids in it. In his grade, not his classroom, but his grade has 50 kids. And I personally would love to stop writing letters of recommendations for my very favorite teachers. And I would love to stop losing these amazing teachers. And I would love to see the schools value the education enough and value the idea that as these aging populations move on, young families are gonna come in and we wanna have schools that will actually attract people to our state, to our towns, to our communities and have it be the vibrant place that it could be. Thank you. Thank you. I don't see any more hands, so we are going to move on now into that presentation. Yeah, I think before talking about what comes on the palette, so the stage is yours. Well, are you going to sing? Are you also sharing that in the room? Can you hear me? It's not even good enough yet, Mark. I like a robust microphone. <laughs> Mm -hmm. I have a Google voice, yeah. Could you go to the first slide, please? Okay. While we're waiting for that, I just want to say welcome to Callis. For some of you, this is your first time coming to Callis. There were some bumpy roads on the way here, I bet, for some of you. Um, I hope that if you didn't get a chance to sample some of the food from our kitchen, it was all food that our chef Dina pulled out from the kitchen that didn't cost extra other than her time and her love. And I will remind everyone that um, May 3rd, uh, the first Friday in May is School Lunch Hero Appreciation Day. Make sure you thank Dina for tonight's meal and um, for folks, please help yourself. Um, and whoever is the lunch hero in your life. And if you need a bathroom, uh, they are right outside. Um, I will start this conversation by saying, being asked um, in these tense times to talk about all that is awesome at Callis about social emotional behavioral learning is hard. And when I look out at some of the folks who are here too, um, support our school system and ask us to think about all the things that we want the board to consider. Um, I want to ground myself in there are some really awesome things that are happening. And I think a lot of what I'm about to talk to can still happen with some of the changes. And I worry that some will be lost, but I want to celebrate what we have going and going well right now. Um, SEBL, Social Emotional Behavioral Learning. Um, uh, Mark, if you're ready, you can go to the first, the next slide. I'm going to talk about some of the basic components to social emotional behavioral learning here at Callis. Responsive classroom, um, which is, uh, that's okay. Um, responsive classroom, which is our approach to social emotional learning for all students. Um, PBIS, which stands for Positive Behavior Intervention System. I got some PBIS folks here. Is it intervention or is it? I don't know. Um, restorative Practices, which is our, um, this is a piece that is shared across all of our buildings in some capacity, um, using structured protocols to approach um, how we come together. Trauma-informed approaches and counseling and our student support system. What you'll see is in the next three slides, these pieces are components that are embedded in every layer of instruction, similar to the layers of instruction that we have for math and reading and writing. Um, at the universal level, meaning it's accessible to all, you will see that responsive classroom looks like a commitment to really teaching explicit instruction and coming together in the first six weeks of the school year. You'll see that it's reflected in morning meeting every day and identifying hopes and dreams um, and identifying classroom agreements that tie to our school-wide agreements. Um, one of the things that I feel like I wanna call out that I think is pretty special about Callis, because I think that you can now read that slide, um, when I talk about 
responsive classroom, PBIS, our counselor, our student support, and our restorative practices. These are all guided by high quality classroom teachers, educators in our classroom. Um, this for universal instruction, this includes our counselor who is here full time and she engages in guidance class um, every week along with our health educator. Um, one of the other things I think that is really important at CALIS around uh, some of the professional development that we do. Sometimes uh, I just had this learning recently in a refresher course for PBIS. Uh, our ESP staff, our paras, our BIs, our personal care assistants, they spend the most time with some of our most vulnerable students. And they do that oftentimes during those less structured times. And we offer them, I think, arguably the least amount of time and training. And one thing I'm really proud of this year is bringing together PD for our ESP staff to help them really understand the connection between responsive classroom and PBIS, um, as well as how all of these elements uh, apply to our discipline plan, our comprehensive discipline plan. Um, can you go to the next slide? In addition to what is already happening in all of our classrooms universally, uh, I would add that there are components in each one of those same pieces that tie into um, targeted instruction, meaning something that we're going to zone in on. One of uh, the pieces I want to highlight um, through targeted instruction, we use our behavior data from through PBIS and uh, responsive classroom to really make data-driven decisions about the school-wide behavior and where we need to um, utilize our resources. We spend a lot of time, probably not as much as we should, because it takes a lot of work, but a lot of time calibrating our approach to PBIS. Um, and as recently as today, our staff meeting was all about how to really recommit and think about those evidence-based practices with and apply them with fidelity. Um, we also use what is called the equity dashboard in um, available to us in Infinite Campus, which is our student information system that tells us um, important information about students who are furthest from justice uh, and how they perform in terms of um, academic achievement, uh, how often they show up in our behavior data and um, their attendance. Um, and that is really important information for us to be able to hone in on. Um, if you could go to the next slide, Mark. Last but not least, and this is something that is, it's not, it's not well built yet, but it is coming. Uh, one of the things that you've probably been hearing about um, for a while now, our district has been uh, working really hard towards implementation of Act 173. And one of the big changes that happened with Act 173, in the past you've probably heard about kids who um, were experiencing challenges and struggles to be successful in school, um, but not necessarily showing an impact in their academics. And that meant a lot of times supports were not um, uh, put in place for students who were struggling. And one of the things that Act 173 brought, uh, aside from a lot of work and learning for all of us, has been this category called functional skills. And one of the things that um, I'm really proud about is that we've taken the structures that we've had in place for a while now and have really honed in on with our work with um, Ellen Dorsey and um, Kara Holden. And uh, worked on our intensive intervention work group. It's a lot of learning for our special educators and our interventionist. And we've applied some of those same strategies, the same framework that we use for reading and math and writing and applied it to functional skills. Things like the social emotional behavioral learning. This is maybe putting the cart before the horse because I'm saying, hey, we have this really great thing put in place. It's not quite there yet. It's coming, it's coming close though. And I wanna make sure that we um, notice that one of the ways that um, this system, not just at Calus, but across our system, will need to be thoughtful about how to support is how do we make sure that kids have the skills that they need to access their education? Um, and uh, the, Lisa will love this because she's the queen of, let's talk about Castle. Um, the, but what we are doing is we are designing some skills group 
for students around the intrapersonal and the interpersonal. Um, trying to think if there anything else that I wanted to add. No. Um, I appreciate the time that you have all taken with me to talk about social emotional behavior learning here at Calis. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kat. Does board members have any questions for Kat? Yeah. I'll leave you sing for us after after we're done. Yeah. Okay. So we're gonna move. Oh. Guys, I just moved my agenda. So we're gonna move to our board discussion, approve the revised budget and some page four. Uh, what I thought we could do, do what? Oh, you can't hear me, sorry. Uh, what I thought we could we could do is just again go around the around the table and just discuss if, if there are any clarifying questions first. And then let's just discuss which budget are you ready to support? So is it the six percent? Is it the eight percent or is it the ten percent? But we're gonna start with any clarifying questions because you had given us some clarifying questions first, and then we will move on into deciding which budget we can support as a board. Um, raise your hand. I, I don't think we need a presentation uh, today. So it's more about the clarifying questions unless I'm getting. Yeah, exactly. So so it's just we we're gonna just open it up for the clarifying questions that the board ask. Do I raise your hand? I can start. Um, so um, the clarifying question I have is um, that um, I don't think we have to pick one or the other or the other of the three options, but that we can go with an a la carte um, putting together of the budget. Uh, I don't think we're bound by uh, you know, option six six percent, eight percent, or ten percent, but we can combine things, uh, and I hope we have that type of discussion, uh, just because there's merit uh, to each of the um, categories um, and percentages, uh, but combining them can achieve, I think, a greater breadth of what we hopefully want for our students, and also realize some um, economic savings. Um, and fully recognizing, as Richard noted, that we are using fund balance. And I think we struggled with that decision as to even get there uh, with uh, great concerns by um, board members about whether that's a good option. It's not a good option, but it seems like it may be a necessary one this year. Uh, and um, I, you know, I, I shared some thoughts with, uh, with an a la, a la carte menu tonight. Uh, and that menu would would have a um, a savings of one million two hundred twenty eight thousand eight hundred eighty eight eighty nine dollars, so it would fall somewhere between the six I think between six and eight percent is my guess. Uh, so I hope we can have that type of discussion um, about what uh, we want to see in terms of uh, approving a budget tonight. Any other questions before I attempt? To... I have a clarifying, yeah, a couple of clarifying questions. So one, um, and perhaps it was just the way I was reading it, but the uh, equitable distribution, I don't quite understand that. So that would be helpful. Then the other part is clarity around what is the actual percentage increase in tax rates, because even though it's a 6% increase, you know, like the 10, eight or six, is actually greater for each community. And I'm just not sure what those percentages are. Perfect, I'll, I'll take the first one and then I'll probably turn to Suzanne for the tax rate. Equitable distribution of resources is just a, it's a check. It's a way to, to look at how our personnel related resources are distributed. So the first thing to know is it's just personnel. It's not uh, supplies and all of the other pieces. It's the, it's teachers and staff in our buildings. And it's a rough calculation of the percentage of students each building serves and the percentage of personnel that they have in their building. So on the left-hand side of that chart is this current year. So um, if we're looking at 
at, say, Berlin, they have about 13.4% of the population. Those numbers are also weighted to take student, uh, to take poverty metrics into account. So just know that that 13.4 is weighted. Um, and they have about 13.6% of the personnel resources in their system right now. Um, that happens to be one that's relatively even. Um, and then the column on the right is just that same calculation with all of the proposals up to 6% because we needed to pick a place. So that's what that chart is. Does that answer that part of the question? It, well, it's, it's, um, I understood what the concept of it is. It's, I am confused because I know our numbers are going down, but it didn't seem to me that they would be dramatic enough that even with cuts, Berlin would stay at 134 but the resources would go up. So it's that's the distribution confused. that changes. So, so essentially it's because there's reductions in other places in the system. So if you look at Callis, oh, excuse me. If you look at Callis, they have in the current year, they have about 9%, just under 9% of personnel resources. And next year with the re proposed reductions, they now have less of a percentage. And so that redistributes those resources. It just sh moves the pie around. Yeah. That's what it is. Yeah. It isn't, um, Berlin isn't receiving more. They're now receiving a bigger percentage of the share because someone else is being um, moved in a different direction. And that would be one of those areas when we're communicating out, we need to be ultra, ultra clear on because if it's confusing those of us who have a better understanding, as a community member, I would not have any clue what this is telling me. Yep. And that information is really for the board. It does not mean you can't choose to say that's also, I think that's important for the community to have. And if it is, then absolutely. But it's that's being given to you to sort of answer the question about resources. The Thank tax you. rate piece I might have Suzanne. Mark, do you have the April 3rd presentation available? I can you? share. I'll share through the Zoom. I have slide 25. Slide 25. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's going to take me just a second to share. What? We do have a presentation. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. You meant the April 3rd, right? This one? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> nope, nope. You did say it. I was making sure I heard it properly. There you go. Okay. Thank you, Spencer. These are the tax rates <laughs> for each town. Um, I do have a column in here for the warned budget that was voted on. That's the 16.14% increase. And then we've got the 10% increase, the 8%, and the 6%. The dollar amount is the dollar change uh, in taxes on a $100,000 home. And then the 26%, for instance, next to Berlin is what you'll see, what we saw with the 16.14%. 20% .14%. Uh, is what you'd see with the 10%, 17% with the eight, and then 15% with the six and so on. Lots of numbers. So it's a little bit. No, this is really helpful. Mm -hmm. Any other questions from board members? Maybe just uh, the the one thing, sorry, Natasha, did you? Oh, okay. um, the one thing that I, I had asked Suzanne about for Berlin specifically, but I think would be helpful in, in ongoing communications is if there's a 0% increase in the level of education spending, what is the increase in the tax rate? Because it's still quite high. So um, I think that that's just a good point for communication going forward that reinforces that the school budget is only one part of, of this um, equation. And so we have control over, only over the spending, which is what we've been saying. But I think having the, the number there is really helpful. So for instance, for Berlin, that's 9% with zero increase in spending. Do you mind if yeah, I go ahead? Um, yes, I can get that for you. Um, if you would put it to slide 20 while we have this up. I did do another visual for you today that I thought would be helpful 
um, in showing you the per pupil spending per long-term weighted average daily membership. Uh, the 16.14% was 15.488 per pupil. 10% uh, would be 14669, 8% 14.402, 6% uh, 14.136. And so when you're looking at percentage increases per pupil, your 8% uh, that you were discussing at, at the last meeting is a 0.7% decrease in spending per pupil. Mm -hmm. uh, so if you're looking at the last line, that's the percentage increase per pupil that you're seeing, or rather decrease in two of the versions. Thank you, Suzanne. Yeah, thank you. Natasha? Yeah, I was just wondering, there's um, two positions at the back of the state um, that of people who are going to be leaving the district. Are those positions that we're planning on filling again, or are any of those positions going to be cut from the budget and not filled? So currently, we're not hosting and hiring for the administrative. I have to remember what the second one is. Who's the? Oh, so. We are hiring for the director of student support services. We can't operate without one. That's that's statutory. We are not currently posting for the vacant assistant principal position. It is not being proposed as a cut. It is not a recommended cut. We talked about that last week. We showed the ratios. We explained why. I understand the board can have a different opinion about that. We explained why it's not on the list, but because we are not just looking at what do we do in the 1086 we are also looking at what happens if it continues to fail that's why we're not posting for it right now do we have an estimate of how much that would be if we didn't fill it yeah do you want that number yeah. you mean dollars yeah. yes dollars thank you yeah any other questions before we move into deliberation? If we're going to get a monetary value for that position, can we talk about what not sending it would do? Oh, I don't think. Yeah, we they shared it at the last meeting, but why don't we go ahead and share it, Megan? I'll let Stephen yeah. speak to that. Ursula is asking. I didn't say what Ursula said. Right, oh. yeah. Okay. I said that if, oh, if we're going to have the monetary value for the assistant principal not being filled, like if it didn't fill and we consider that as part of our cuts, what would it do to the education system and the school that it would affect? I think what we can do is reiterate, I'll let Steve, I'm not going to speak for Stephen, but reiterate what we talked about last week, which is why it's not being recommended for cutting. So uh, at uh, trying not to go into too much detail, although I could, um, you know, we have uh, we do have five administrative positions at U32. Um, so the assistant principal position is responsible for a great deal of teacher supervision, student supervision. Um, and in fact, the supervision ratios, um, those are the ones that are up there uh, for U32 are are at what we would consider educational quality standards. So what would have to happen is the, the responsibilities for supervising teachers and for supervising students would have to be uh, re um, distributed amongst the administrators that are there. I would stress that one of those positions is our student support um, position, the director of student services. That position supervises some teachers and also has a caseload of students for school counseling. And so increasing the duties of the other administrators reduces services to students as well um, in that area. Um, I, I mean, I don't, I, I guess it's hard to say exactly how many different duties there are uh, for an administrator, but it would mean that your supervision in co-curricular activities that, that uh, administrators do would have to be reduced. Um, there's a list of things. There's a reason we didn't propose it is because dividing up the responsibilities of one administrator in a school that is does not have a declining enrollment for next year seemed um it didn't seem prudent it's really Thanks. i mean i can answer specific questions if there are yep. thank you oh you have yeah suzanne you have the number uh 149 and that's just salary, not benefits. No, no. Everything. It's everything. Yeah. Okay, thank you. I gotta give you just a 
Thank you, Mark. Okay. Any other questions before we move? I do have a response for Chris, not a response, but a suggestion for you, Chris. So the suggestion, suggestion was, can you hear me? Kind of, but, but it might be my ears too. You're, in, no, you're, you're fine. going. Okay, it's going. Oh, yeah. you no, but, but ears wide open. So if you're pretending that you can't hear me, please hear me. You know, I'll drop my pen when I don't want to hear. Okay. The so because the decisions made closest to the students can best be tailored to individual needs, if we empowered our principals, which is what we did, right? We empowered our principals. It's what Megan did. We empowered us to have autonomy and control of their budgets subject to accountability, which is what we do when we monitor, right, as a board, uh, then resources will be moved wisely, will be wisely spent, and then supports and approaches will be customized to raise student achievement, which is our ultimate goal, right? I think our, what we're doing here. So if we, I'm a little afraid to tell you the truth, that we are just going to dismantle the work that the the our administrators have done that are closest to their students by trying to do this a la carte uh, mode what we uh, what we did is like we hired the best people i i'm absolutely sure that you know megan is the best thing that has ever happened to this district to, to tell you the truth as a superintendent we have susan that is also and i know that we all believe that we have the best principles we have the best leadership team and here we are our expertise are in monitoring and setting goals and setting and setting priorities and setting parameters and we put all those restrictions on them and tell them to think creatively and they came up with these three proposals right an eight percent a six percent and a ten percent for us to take into consideration so i don't understand why we can't look let's say look at the eight percent for example we are reducing our costs. we're being responsible with our community members we're reducing our cost half of what we had presented before, right? We had 16% before, a half reduction. They're telling us that I, I know it might not feel perfect for, I, I'm hearing our communities too. We have we are been put in a very difficult position, but we are gonna be serving our students. And then that puts us a little step forward to be able to look at a reconfiguration and, and, and move into a more sustainable uh, future once we're able to reconfigurate a little bit too. So I would like us to, to speak to each, I'm not, we can do what is the pleasure of the board, but I would like us to stay, con, you know, uh, concentrated in one of the three options that the that the leadership has brought over to us and decide as a board and stay behind so that we could move on in how we're gonna communicate this plan to our community so that we can have the support of our communities to do what is best for kids. So if we could speak to that, that would be wonderful. We don't necessarily have to st start with you, Chris, but we can start with whoever wants to speak uh, right now. But... Since you're directing your comments to me, yeah, I'm going go to respond, um, is that we are also the liaison between our community uh, and our administration and our school system. We represent the community as a whole, yeah. okay? Uh, and I agree that we hire uh, great staff members to help us in moving toward those policy goals that we have set forth. Um, you know, if you look at these cuts, there are almost exclusively for direct service uh, providers for our students. So it sounds hollow to say this is what's best for students while we're reducing uh, almost exclusively in the direct service realm. Now, I know it's probably necessary because, you know, staff makes up 80% of our budget. So if we're going to have a budget cut, that's where it's got to be. Um, mostly, um, but we don't, you know, we haven't considered other um, different stuff like the central office untouched untouched here and the what i'm trying to do is uh, balance things where we still maintain direct services for students especially in terms of nursing counseling um arts things that we hear are vital for uh student development particularly in the younger ages i mean we've always been focused on maintaining resources for the younger staff uh, younger students because those are the foundational building blocks for future students uh and and we're cutting that's where our primary cuts are they're not at u32 uh they're they're in the 
elementary schools. And that just seems to me that that is a disservice to our students. So I'm, again, my job is to give the board information, answer questions, tell you how we made the decision. So I'm going to give a couple bits of information that are related to some of the questions. Mm -hmm. The board can take a different action. So I'm not, I'm not trying to defend the position, but I am trying to explain it. Okay. So one of the questions that we've gotten um, and, and heard comment wise, sorry, it takes me a minute to share. Administration. So central office has reduced, we're reducing an administrative position, a, a position that is the director of technology. It is not a position I would normally recommend. So we are reducing in central office. We've gotten a couple of different comments. So I just want to explain when you look at the functional area of central office, it's actually office of the superintendent and it looks, and it is a 45% increase year to year. And we did answer this last week, but just kind of reiterating. That is because we did, the board approved us to add a position. We absolutely do not recommend reducing that position. That is why we're recommending a different reduction. So central office is absolutely giving recommendations. The reason that looks like a, that reason that is a 45% increase is it was a smaller number to begin with. So that percentage wise, it looks bigger. I also just want to illustrate, and again, my job isn't to debate you on where you where you land. If if the board take makes a motion and votes it, that is that is what will happen. But so that you have the information you need. So this chart shows the distribution of our resources. So we hear quite a bit. We're not cutting enough in the area of either central office or administration. Proportionately, we can't. There isn't enough money there. So the blue, the light, the I don't know, lighter color, non-Navy blue, that is instructional programming. That's all of our teachers, all of our support staff, all of the people in front of um, students. And the red is special education. So it's those same functional roles, but, but under the special ed. That is the vast majority of our budget, which is why it is the biggest proportion of staffing reductions. It is not because we are selectively choosing to cut in other places. We've talked a lot and it does not mean that these feel good. It does not mean that we, they don't have impact, but it is the approach that the board asked us to do, which is can we serve the students in the system? I understand there's lots of different feelings about that, but we're just explaining how we got there. That green line, that is the functional area of administration. So it has seen a reduction in partial FTEs and in a position that's also the, that category includes the board's budget area. So um, everything that you do, your legal fees, that all fits in that part of the pie chart. So we actually are taking proportionate reductions because all of those areas, central office administration, it's a smaller piece of the pie. So I just want the board to have that information as you do your deliberation. And I would, you know, we've given you the recommendation. We think that this is what we can do to meet the needs of kids. If the board puts a different motion on the table and it passes, then that is what administration will do. So, but that is also why we're not coming to you with a different recommendation because this is our recommendation. So our job is to try to give you information. Your job as a board is to discuss it and see where you land. And I can't remember if there's something else I was gonna show you. I, I think that was it. Are we ready? Kelly? I also maybe just, I don't know. Is this working? Yeah. Yeah. Use the mouse. Okay. I I just want to clarify because Chris, I think did you say that you thought there were not cuts being made from U32? No. You know, I didn't if I said none, that was I said the line, I think I was saying the line share are the direct service providers. Um mm -hmm. to and in the elementary school. And I know there are some at U32, but they're I think given size, they're better able to absorb cuts than elementary schools are because there are much fewer staff members in the elementary school. And so um, I was not saying that a U32 hasn't taken cuts because they are, absolutely are. Okay. Administration, yes. And I, I see a distinction between not filling a position than actually cutting someone who's in a position already. And so there are a couple of things here, like for U32 uh, in, in um, number six, saying we're not gonna fill certain positions. So that's not cutting bodies. That's just not filling what may have been budgeted. And, you know, 
the director of technology uh, is in now a vacant spot. So it's not cutting that position. It's just not filling it. Gives an opportunity for not filling it and not expending that budget. But I see that as slightly different than you have people in these positions performing the services for our students, especially the younger students, they're actually losing time and they're going to be cut. That has a big, big difference. And your cat, I'm going to put you on the spot here. I just hate to say it, but, but I'm sorry. I'm sorry, but I am. But when you were giving about the social emotional, you had said, what a great thing we have. And you kind of said, I hope it sticks um, because of the personnel changes, I'm assuming. Am I right there? Or is it's, it? It's tricky because the web, so many cuts. Um, I, <laughs> this thing. I don't know how to um, answer, Chris, because there are so many implications for when you cut in one area, it, it because we are a merged district that causes cuts across the district. And what I have started to build here is based on the people I have here now. Mm -hmm. But um, I don't know. I'm not saying that we can't still make functional skills groups work right. um, going forward. Um, but I, it takes more than just um, a role. Um, or an FTE, it takes the right person, it takes the right skills. Mm -hmm. It's magic. It all has to mm -hmm. come together. Yeah. Um, magic maybe isn't a good word. I do believe that magic should be broken apart and figured out what made it work magical. <laughs> um, uh, and Culture. Culture. I, I do think Culture. I've got something pretty magical here with the folks that I have. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. That's is that fair? Yeah. Thank Can you. Can I just finish? I was not actually finished yeah, sorry. though. Um, I, I understand what you're saying, but I also know that there are many people maybe online or that are going to listen to this that aren't looking at the numbers. Right. And so I don't want that to be the narrative because there are almost $400,000 of cuts coming from positions at U32 that are not just unfilled vacancies. Right. And I'm, so that actually is really the lion's share of the cuts when you compare that to the elementary school. Yeah. It's just that people aren't, we're not hearing about them. Well, so... I mean, I can do the math quickly. It's kind of close, but I think that the U32 teachers are actually more than the elementary school teachers. If you want to do that, do that, because that will help with the debate. I mean, if you want to do the calculation. And I have, a, com math I have a calculator okay. if you want it. Uh, Zach. I just, I just, okay. That's I'm fine. going to try to take a little bit of a pause in this conversation. Um, I want to, I'm going to start by reading from one of the letters we, we got. This is from a teacher at EMES. Um, she said she was disappointed you know, in some of the response to the budget, particularly around um, discussion about being a la carte and commented that, you know, our, you know sp speaking about our administration, she said they spent hours and hours coming up with the three, just like you asked. I appreciate the conversation, but to hear you say that we can just take them a la carte and pick and choose was so disrespectful in my opinion. Do you not think they went through each item and thought very carefully about how it impacts students first, the impact on each school? They are the experts in the schools. They know how each school functions. They know how one thing will impact the other. I'm worried about the direction we're going here. I think, I mean, yeah, these cuts are, are hard. Yeah, there is, there are questions about you know, which, which school bears the brunt. This is what, you know, we weren't present for all of these conversations. You know, Pete, you know, when you know, I, I trust that our leadership team had the conversation about what comes out of elementary schools versus what comes out of U32 and what makes sense and what makes sense with our enrollment. You know, we we heard last, you know, last meeting that, you know, once the scheduling actually happened, they discovered that you know they could they could change, you know, how many teachers they had in U32, and that wasn't known before. You know, that's a real that kind of decision doesn't have to be dependent on, well, who else got cut? That, that's a decision based on what works. And so I'd ask that we trust that our, your, your, I mean, probably trust but verify, but your, tr your trust that our leadership team thought really hard about what was going to work for our students. Okay, any other questions? So can you get started, Diane? Yeah, so certainly. I mean, I think for, for myself, I also want to take back a narrative of what I've had pushed at me 
repeatedly at board meetings and in conversations with community as one of those members last year who voted to increase the budget and move that forward. It was not because I was swayed by the emotional responses. It was because I took additional information and I looked at it. No one of us at the table said, we don't wanna consider cuts and we're not gonna look at cuts. And we're not even, I don't even hear that now. What my narrative is, is we requested an opportunity to start these conversations early. We requested the opportunity to really explore how deep we needed to go and have those conversations so that maybe not to be distrustful, but is there a way for us to engage our communities in responding, similar to when Zach was talking about telehealth or different things. It was the opportunity to explore that early on. Those of us who voted last year on the budget, that's what we were requesting. We were not requesting to put our heads in the sand and not consider the cuts that are needed and the reality of where we are. So I am taking that narrative back that to me, this is a, a ripple of consolidation. We don't understand the true costs for each one of our communities. And that is what's creating this um, sticker shock to what we're doing. We are impacted by consolidation because it changes the role of this board. We are not the individual boards. So therefore that transparency or that ability to interact directly with our board members looks different. And when we try to have those, I'm being told I'm mismanaging, micromanaging, and I am demonstrating ineffective board. I, asking questions to me is not being disrespectful. Asking questions is how I learn. It's how I taught my children to learn. It's how I worked as a teacher. Questions and dialogue are how we get to a compromise and to an understanding. Um, and so, you know, I we don't really understand the true ripple. So even at looking at that chart and understanding exactly what you're saying about the shifting of resources, I still don't know what that means for Doty. I still don't know what that means for Callis. I don't know what that means for Berlin. There's, we have to work on that part of the transparency. We weren't kicking the can down the road. We were trying to figure out what we needed to do in that moment. What I am also concerned about, and I don't know which way I'm going yet because I've heard from a variety of community members around the different parts of these budgets and the frustrating part of the financial system that still is gonna, no matter what we choose, is gonna have a huge impact on our taxpayers, on myself and on our families. But we talk about ed quality standards. They're more than just the ratios. The ed quality standards help us set up our librarian expectations of direct, you know, the little mini directors of technology within each of our buildings. So I'm very concerned that we're not only a couple of years after a major hack, we aren't, you know, we're not going to rehire the director of technology and we're looking to reduce those hours of our librarians. And in this day and age, it just concerns me. So I just want to say that the reason why we might be kind of bouncing around on these numbers, we all are trying to figure out what our real role is as members of the community and what these ripples mean, because we're it, it's just not clear even to me. Kelly, are you ready to share which? Um, yeah, I mean, I, this is really, really difficult. I think we, we hear a lot and of course we care deeply about student needs. And we also had a budget that was voted down a few weeks ago and the operating on an 87% budget, if this happens twice more, just really, really scares me. And so I think that we really need to take this opportunity to balance what we hear from many people in this room with what the voters told us a few weeks ago. Um, these tax increases are not small, even with the 8%, it's, you know, it's a 17% increase in taxes in Berlin. Um, that's huge. 
it's just it's so much um and so i i am leaning toward the eight percent i think hearing from community members i i'm not hearing that the ten percent is is viable necessarily um and yeah so i will i will stop there that's where my head is thank you kelly ursula Given what we've heard from community members about their ability to shoulder the cost of our budget increases and the very thoughtful process that our administrators and leadership team has put into coming up with our um, three alternatives here, and they've talked about it last week and in this week's packet, I would support the six or the eight percent. Thank you, Ursula. Zach? Thinking about where sort of what is uniquely our responsibility, our, our responsibility is to make sure that we get a budget passed that can support our kids and to recognize that that I'm I really am not comfortable gambling on, you know, a you know, on a tax increase that's too high that could leave us in a position where even if we don't pass on this on the next try and but have to go again, then we're looking at we're probably not just looking at the cuts that are on this page. We're probably looking at what what else can we take out that our that our leadership has said, you know, th this is really going to start you know hurting programming. So when I think about like what I think about both the things that Pete the that we've heard from the community and you know and the things that we and the things that we we see here, I think. With the eight percent, I think I could look someone in the eye who says, "You know what? You can only get it down to eight percent." And I could say, "You know what? We have, you know, you know, our average daily membership went up, you know, eight point six percent last year. That's that we changed the system. That's an empirical statement that the you know that we got that the students you know should cost more to educate. And so saying you know eight you know taking that increase is I think valid. Um, and I think that. And I think to be able to look someone in the eye and say, yeah, in terms of the the education, in terms of the component that comes from the spending of education, we kept you at a little below zero. I think I could really defend. I, I think it would get really hard in that situation to to look at someone saying, I can't afford this, even keeping it level. I can't can't afford this. If we're if we're leaving things on the table where that are really based on enrollment that are really where we're saying are you know where we don't need as many ftes because we don't have as many classrooms to teach um and the last and the last thing i want to say on the on the public feedback we've we've certainly received a, a lot of feedback we've see, received a certain amount of feedback from from the general public we've see, received a lot of feedback from people who are directly affected and I think that is absolutely, absolutely valid. That is important to learn from you know, people about what the what these positions mean. I think it's also our responsibility as a board to um, to recognize that that is that that is not necessarily representative of the community at large, and we need to think about that as we think about this feedback. Um, and I think we need to think about the feedback we received from the survey, where the where the largest group of people was saying that that this is unsustainable. And from the vote, where almost 1,900 people said we can't keep doing this. Thanks. Thank you, Seth. Jonathan. Yeah, could you, um, Floor, somebody just remind us again? The three proposals here are are built on the all previous reductions. So, what were the previous reductions again that we've already that are essentially on the table, but somewhat Megan opaque? Megan is going right to share now. this slide. So the community is aware of that as well. Yep. Any second. In the ten percent column. Yeah. No, no. He means like these are the these are the previous. So these are in the January seventeenth budget proposal, and then the three column chart in your packet is in addition to these. This chart's also in last week's packet. Just to be clear.
Yeah, I mean, I don't have really a whole lot to say other than um, we are in a really, really difficult place. And, um, but as I mentioned at our meeting last week, uh, we need to make the best decision with the best information we have available at the time. And right now, and I still think that looking at the three proposals here, one of which includes using a significant amount of fund balance, uh, that was presented in good faith. So in my opinion, we ought to, I would be more comfortable with the six, but the 6% using as much fund balance as possible, fully understanding that we may have a significant cost for asbestos remediation at U32, but as of this point right now, that's an unknown cost. We don't know what that is. What we know is we have to pass a budget. So, so I would be inclined to use as much fund balance as possible and have as few staff reductions as possible. Because when I look at what we have, that was what was presented to the voters on the screen there. There's three counselor positions there. You know, um, and so any of these additional three proposals include, except for the 6%, include significantly more staff reductions. So I know that I'm on a limb here a little bit, but that's okay. That's kind of how I live. Um, so I would say we use as much fund balance as we can possibly stomach and get the, and get the increase down as much as possible uh, at the same time, limiting as many staff reductions as we can. Thanks, Jonathan. Michelle? Okay. Well, I have to say that this is so hard for me because I also have worked with all these people for a lot of years, and I care about them all, but um, I, I feel like I don't agree with using as much of our fund balance as possible because... Again, the um, PCBs at U32, and um, that, that'll just put us in the hole somewhere. And the fund balance is just a Band-Aid. And we've heard that multiple times from many community members. It's just a Band-Aid. The fiscal cliff was really high last year. It didn't go down. We knew this was coming. I sat in the board meetings last year when all this, we knew this was coming. So um, I am com comfortable with the 8%. I'm also comfortable with the 8%, including the positions in the 6%, which would then put us at like a 7.5 or something like that percent. There are other budgets. Other schools are already voting. There's their revotes and they're going down. There's four school districts already that have gone down and Essex just did theirs for the first time and it went down again. We can't we can't put out a budget that they're not gonna support, that our our towns aren't gonna support. And the tax impact is getting higher and higher. Our increases, it was almost 10% last year. To do another 10% this year is, people aren't getting 10% increases in their pay. They can't afford that. Um, so we really need to try to figure out how we can pare this down as best as we can, so. Thank you, Michelle. Daniel. Um, I appreciate the updated memo and the extra information provided tonight. So thank you for that. Um, there's, seems like there's pain in every direction um, with these options in front of us. I'm reluctantly trying to focus on choosing a number because I, while I appreciate the thought that goes into these options, the notion of like these positions being cut doesn't to me represent no reduction in service to our little customers. Um, so I, I just, I want to acknowledge that it, I, the, the, Reduction in service to me feels pretty visceral. Um, uh, again, I'm trying to focus on um, 
choosing a number and and keeping my eye on that. But I also think there's some important messages um, that we're learning through through this process. Um, I'm on board with what Diane was saying. I think it's sort of like the Socratic method of budget development is sort of what we're going through. And that's maybe a silver lining of having a budget go down is, you know, more learning about what's happening and what the reper repercussions are of, of all these cuts. Um, I, I liked Zach's idea. I'm interested in exploring like creative ways of, you know, covering, uh, 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 what I see is a shortage of nursing staffing um, with, you know, sort of supplemental telehealth, if that's if that's something we can do for um, an affordable price tag, I I'd like to explore that. I'd like to um, not be as focused on the proportionality of resources in schools like this. To me, we know that our elementary schools use more resources. That's one of the main reasons we're exploring reconfiguration as seriously as we are. And I don't think that's something we necessarily have to fix with this budget. Um, I'm, I'm really concerned about the allied arts positions and all these sort of specialized talents that people are bringing to the schools and then sort of trying to cram that service into 45 minute, 45 minute boxes for students because it's, I live with an art teacher. Art is sort of a sprawling thing. And to, to try to compartmentalize that and then the whiplash that students and teachers are gonna face with, you know, going from one 45 minute section to another, I, it strikes me as an incredible challenge. And I'm sure that same is true uh, with the library services we offer. I'm so sure the same is true with the music services and with the PE as well. Um, one last thing is I think that the ed quality standards are statewide standards. I'm, I continue to be frustrated with our focus on them in these, um, these budget proposals. I think an action step for me, I know we're gonna, we're gonna vote on adopting the sort of final version of the strategic plan after this. And one thing I'd like to come out of the strategic plan in terms of a specific action step is to create a Washington Central lens that we look at the ed quality standards through. Uh, Honey mentioned in her um, in her comments, you know, a previous commitment we had made, or you know, we looked at the reconfiguration option through this lens of, you know, will there be a nurse in every school? Will there be a counselor in every school? These are the types of things that we need to stand up for with the strategic plan and and look at, you know, I don't, I reject the notion that a statewide ed quality standard is gonna apply for this district. And I, I don't wanna keep doing that. Um, but I think we do have to focus on a number here where we can't, I don't think we can or should debate the budget in the same way we debated it in January. I mean, in the many ways the voters have tied our hands here. Um, I, I think 8% is where I'm landing for now. Thank you, Daniel. Natasha. Um, I have all kinds of thoughts. I'm trying to figure out how to articulate them well. Um, I think I want to start with, you know, we always talk about the three pillars that our district uses um, to set an expectation for a standard of what we want our students to receive. And I think that these cuts are going to greatly diminish our ability to provide our students with something from all three of those standards, or all three of those pillars. Um, and I think that we have heard from the community last year and this year that there is a want and a need for those services to remain intact. Um, I also feel strongly that those are services that need to be remain intact. When we had our community conversations at the last board meeting about reconfiguration, one of the things that came out loud and clear is that community wanted opportunities for these, our, their students and all of these cuts 
are impacting the opportunities that we're going to be providing for our students next year. Um, I also hear from the community loud and clear that there is a concern about how much um, this is going to impact them financially. And I am trying to be incredibly thoughtful about that and conscious of that. And I'm, and I'm really struggling with weighing those two things. Um, because education costs a lot of money. <laughs> and if we really want to provide our students with the best quality education that we can, that's going to cost money. Um, and I and I agree with some of the public comments that I don't think we've done a very good job communicating with the community about the importance of what it costs to educate our students and have our students to become the um, the individuals we want them to be when they leave our district. Um, I'll just leave it at that. I I am not ready to say one way or another which of those three um, I I can I can agree to right now, but I'll just leave it at that. Um, I also I've been quite torn these past couple of weeks, um, thinking through this again and again, and hearing from the community from both all sides really passionately. Um, you know, I so appreciate what Diane said about previous budget cycles. Um, and this wasn't, you know, I disagree with that narrative that we just kicked the can down the road and now we're stuck. Um, what's different this year from prior years was prior years, we had the support of the majority of the community. And this year, I, you know, fought to add some stuff that I felt was very important back into the budget. And I had hope that the community would support it and and they didn't. Um, and now, now we're in a position where the majority of the community did not support our budget, which is a completely different scenario and one that I don't think this district has ever been in. Um, and the we need to pass a budget. I mean, that's that's the most important thing right now. Um, it it breaks my heart to um, rein back the full time nursing and counseling in each school. I think that's so critical long term. I think there are lots of ways to get creative. I have to just put a quick sidebar as the family doctor in the room that telehealth is great for many things, but. Mm -hmm. You know, when a kid falls off the slide and breaks his leg and the nurse is not right there, like mm. it's not helpful. So, um, but, but it will, you know, we can talk about lots of creative options with next year's budget cycle. Um, but anyway, it breaks my heart to pull back the nursing and counseling. It breaks my heart to shave away at all these amazing teachers in the allied arts and what that might mean for our students. Um, but again, I think we're in a, position where we where we need to pass this budget and so if I had to pick one actually I'd, I'd go with the six percent because there's nothing because what breaks my heart is in the eight and the ten column and not so much in the six um so if we're picking one it would be six if we were doing all a cart it would be six and adding back in the, um, the nurses and counseling and allied arts but I, but I'm not sure we want to go down the a la carte route. So thank you, Michaela. Chris. Okay. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so I, I don't have a problem with the eight percent. I have a problem with the allocation. Uh and it's the allocation that I think should be uh, up to debate and moving around. Uh, I realize we're in a, a tough budget year, um, but and and the board does have a role. We're not mere rubber stamps, and we can uh, speak our voice and reflect our community's desires uh, for certain things that they want to see in their schools, like uh, librarians, which have an exponential effect across the learning community. They're not just shuffling books around. It's technology. It's integration with many different classroom uh, events. So it's not a it's not a singular um, role. It's a multifaceted role. Uh, so I, I'm 
supported above the 8%, but not this configuration. And I think we have it within our um, abilities to re-alter the configuration. And it's not disrespectful. I agree with Diane. It's not disrespectful, not disrespectful to answer questions or ask questions and have a different opinion. If it is, what are we even doing here? Why would we why would we even have an elected board if you're asking questions of, of the folks that we hire uh, and ask them to explain things and then come to a different conclusion? Uh, why would why are we even here then? I mean, this professional, people come in, ask her opinion, they go, ah, you know what? We love your opinion, but we're not gonna accept it. We're gonna go somewhere else. Great. That's that's the way the expertise works. Um, you can pick and you can choose. Uh, and, and again, it's not disrespectful, just seeing things differently because our administrators do come a, a, from a, a vantage point that they have, which may not necessarily resonate with the community. I mean, there's, uh, anyway, I support the 8%, not this allocation. And I wouldn't vote for this 8% allocation as it is. That's as far as it comes. Yeah. You can you can take it out, Amelia, too. Oh, that was good. Um, first of all, I just want to thank everybody who made a comment. Um, and in last meeting, um, I really appreciate the energy and the care and um, the discourse. I think that um, everybody in this room is passionate about public education. And in a perfect scenario, we wouldn't be making any cuts, or if we would, we wouldn't be cutting any of the allied arts uh, programs. And um, at the end of last meeting, I said that I would, I was leaning towards the 10%, ideally without any cuts to the allied arts. Um, and I'm appreciating the complexity of the financial cliff that we're all facing. Um, and so I think that it's not so much an either, or I don't think we're really against each other. Anyone's against each other. I think it's a both. And I think that we're trying to figure out how do we get all the needs met to the best of our capacity. And I'm convinced that the administrators and the principals who made these recommendations for the 10 and eight and 6% cuts are the experts we need to really trust and confide in um, to lead us in that decision. And um, so I'm thinking about, you know, if we if we go for the 10% and it doesn't pass and we've got, we're kicked back to the 80% of last year's budget, we're jeopardizing the sustainable solution, which is reconfiguration. Um, we're jeopardizing quality education for our students, which it was stated has the intention of giving the students as good of a quality education that they have now without any of these cuts, if not better. Um, and so beginning with the end in mind, I think that the recommendation that Richard made actually, if we can go for the 6% and not use the fund balance and we land somewhere in the 8% range, we can preserve what we have to the best of our capacity with the vision of the sustainable solution for reconfiguration. Thank you, Amelia. Uh, Joshua. Hi, everyone. Uh, my apologies for being a little late. I hope the speaker is not too loud. Um, I would support either the 8% or the 6% budget proposal. I know in the past I've been really critical about um, infrastructure spending, not like, you know, not taking money away from fund balance or um, our capital plan. Um, in the spirit of, you know, coming together, I will totally um, moderate those views and, you know, and no matter how we get to those numbers, I'll support that. Um, even if that's in areas I'd rather not see that money come from. So again, I will support the 6% uh, or the 8% proposal. Thanks. Thank you, Joshua. Okay, so are we ready for a motion so that we can discuss? We have a motion pending. Yeah, well, that's true that we 
pass the other motion. So we had a motion by Ursula, second, which I'm forgetting right now, by yeah. Zach. So we what was that motion? To approve the 8% budget. Well, it was more than that. It was the 8% budget as, as, presented. as presented. As presented. 8% budget as presented. As presented. As presented. As presented. As presented. Yes. That's, that's, what that's what we're doing. That's where we're talking. Yep. Yeah, that's where we're talking. Okay, so we have a motion on the table by Ursula, second by Sack. Any discussion or are we ready for a vote? Sack? I, I have one question actually for the administration. I know that we've heard some you know, some support for between 8 and 6 percent, and particularly. I heard a lot of people who were concerned about taking too much fund balance. I also heard some interest in potentially taking the staffing reductions from the six percent. Um, and I know that tr trying to trying to respect the expertise, but also know that we're talking some between two scenarios. I was just sort of wondering for administration like, is when when you thought about this, you know, if you were going to go below the eight percent, do you say, oh, the first thing we would take would be the fund balance, or do you say the first thing we would take would be the the Let's not ask Stephen. <laughs> <laughs> well, the cops are in his building. We heard his answer last week. So I, I just wanted to say that I would start it by saying, I can't just lean into this. Um, oh, there's one right there. That we didn't think about it that way. He, what we thought about to get down to the six is the most judicious amount of fund balance because we too were concerned about going all the way to the 923. So we really didn't, I would say, hold up those two things against each other. Um, I don't know, Stephen, if you would weigh in. I mean, it, th that is an impactful reduction in the six. Yeah, I, I mean, I think, as I said last time, Chris, um, we really were concerned with what were enrollment decisions, the 10% reductions, what were program modifications, which would have been 8% reductions, and the 6% reductions were were program or service loss. And for, for the, and, and I, I said that for, for U32, I couldn't speak to every detail of the elementary schools, but um, those positions are definitely U32, the biggest one in there. And um, I, I would say that I'm I'm actually hesitant more so today than I was last time because of some staffing issues that we have in our building grounds right now that we didn't have as of the last meeting. And so I just I would be I would be actually looking to see are there other ways to go about that even at this point in time. I think for me it's the the bottom line number that the board gives me. These are my recommendations. And I will do the best that I can to meet all of those. Just a point of clarification. The, what I see in number six is just personnel, not programming. Unless personnel well, is so intimately. Well, well I would say programming. So programming and services is the way that I, I hope that I express that. So this person. Well, you did. But in this number six, I only see personnel. Correct. And that would affect the services that we can provide within our school. So okay. if we had the building and grounds uh, position was cut, right. that would be a reduction in the services that we could provide to our school. Now, th as you said, those aren't necessarily the person in front of a kid teaching, but right. keeping our building open is probably an important part of teaching kids. Thank you, Stephen. Any other questions, uh, Natasha? Yeah, um, just to- Can you use the mic just Sorry. for the people online? Yeah, this is just a clarifying question. When you put up the positions that were being cut with the previous budget, it included two ESP positions that were unfilled, and the 6% also has two ESP positions that are unfilled. Is that two additional? Okay, I just wanted to make sure that, yep. that was Yep, total of four. Thank you. Yep. Okay, any other clarifying questions before we vote? Uh, Daniel? Um, maybe there are comments more than questions. There's sort of a question in there. Uh, I was just going to reiterate a point I made last time around, um, which is that the use of the fund balance gives me pause. Um, the amount, 485000 is is a lot. And I, I don't want us to not use fund balance next budget. 
because we're gonna have to, we're gonna have to basically make up that entire that entire uh, amount in cuts next time around if we don't use fund balance. So I am voting for the eight percent and the use of four hundred and eighty five thousand dollars in fund balance with the full expectation that I'm going to also advocate for two hundred and whatever it is forty two thousand dollars in fund balance for our next budget. Okay. So that this, so it's a graduated step up in in terms of dependence on that, uh, that one time, uh, those one time funds. I also wanted to just say that I, I also support uh, the reduction to an eight percent spending increase, um, but I don't necessarily support the way. I'm not I'm not endorsing this list of cuts. I'm endorsing the 8% spending increase and I think it's uh you know if if the if the situation changes if the landscape changes if we've learned things if our administration has learned things through this process and feels like changes should be made to this list I hope they will come to us with those changes and I, I, for one, would be very receptive to hearing about changes to that list. So the Thank you, of, Daniel. The point of clarification is that if we vote yes on the motion that is currently pending as it is, the administration has no obligation to come back to us. And and we will we are endorsing these cuts. Um, and so let's not fool ourselves that we're not doing that uh, because we're endorsing cuts that are, that are on this paper right now. Um, for that eight percent budget cut, and I would be stunned uh, if if that was reconfigured uh, in any way, just because this, at least what I've heard, it's delicately balanced together. And if you pull out one of these pieces, it falls apart. Um, so I would be stunned if there's any retooling of this, because we're not voting on an eight percent increase to be then reallocated. We're voting on this proposal and these cuts. So if we want something different than that, we can say we're voting for an 8% increase, but we're not being, you know, and, and ask the administration to, to come back with a different allocation. Um, otherwise, I think we're voting on these allocations. Can I just respond to that? Go ahead, Daniel. Before I... I understand that. Mm -hmm. And I think our our opinions, while well, we, we, we have the same opinion about not endorsing this list of cuts, mm -hmm. I'm just leaving the door open for them to change their mind, I would not be stunned. That would not be the word I would use if they changed some, some version of some part of this list. It's fine with me if this is their professional judgment and this remains their professional judgment as to how to use that 8% spending increase. I would also be okay if it changed. So just to be clear. Question? Yeah, just, just Natasha. Well, yeah, go ahead, Natasha. The motion that is on the table is eight percent to support the so budget presented as as, written. as is right. written. So administration could not make any changes. No, no, no. But to the yeah, yeah but I mean, as written, I, I just want to make sure that I'm clear on what as written means. Yep, which is what is listed here. I hope this answer doesn't sound like I'm trying to just split the difference because <laughs> that is our recommendation. So your motion is to accept that recommendation. And so, yes, that is our intention to do just that. To Daniel's point, just like uh, we would come to you in August if we had an influx of kindergarten students and needed to add a teacher, we would come to you and ask for that. Or if we had a mass shift in something related i can't even think of the example we would come to you with changes we do make changes to what we do based on the circumstances so i guess i am kind of threading the middle yeah, yes i just i just want to make sure that if, if it's if we vote yes on the motion as it is stated that there is flexibility to make changes if administration sees fit because the way it's stated is we are voting on it as it's written. Yes. And the so, re yes, I, I just want to. Yes, there's flexibility. And I don't want to over promise. Like, I don't want you to think like we have some plan behind the scenes. And right. That's all. Thank you. 
Ursula. So Megan pretty much covered what I was going to say is that we, our language, our budget language goes out with a dollar amount. Mm -hmm. They have showed us how at this point in time with what they know, how they plan to allocate that money mm -hmm. so that we can understand the budget and make our decisions. I was not in any way with my motion trying to say they have to spend it exactly this way. They need to be able to make their decisions as the time moves on from here until September, August, when they start seeing actual enrollment numbers, should something spike, should something change. I fully expect them to use whatever money we vote on in a way that is judicious for our students. Thank you. Correct. I just wanted that clarification because yeah. again, Correct. the wording of the motion, the wording of the motion is should that the intent that I didn't okay. want to allocate. Yeah. Got it. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, any other questions? Michaela? Oh, it's my question, it's comment. Can I make a comment? You can comment. Okay. <laughs> um, okay, I know I think I said 10% at last meeting and then this meeting I said six. I'm a little worried with the 8% that we're not gonna make anybody happy because most, most of what we heard was either, this is far too much money, we need to get down closer to 5% right. or we heard, don't cut the allied arts. <laughs> And it, with 8%, we're cutting the allied arts, we're cutting nursing and counseling, but we're still not getting it as low as a lot of people would like it to be. I didn't hear any, and maybe they're just not talking, but I didn't hear anyone in the community saying, please don't cut the buildings and ground director. I understand, Stephen, that it's not ideal, but I guess I just worry that by treading a line in the middle, we're, we're gonna lose people on both sides. And again, I think the most important thing is to pass the budget. So I'm still advocating for the 6%. So go ahead. Or so that, that 6% includes the cuts from 8% and 10%. They are inclusive. No, no, no. Yep. That's my point, though. I think, I think we're cutting what some people don't want us to cut, but we're not getting it low enough for it. the people who need it lower. But I think if we made them, but or should I go first? I mean, we're also with that six percent using eight hundred and sixty-four thousand dollars of our fund balance. It's not an awful lot, like floating your household expenses on your credit card, yeah. which is very hard to recover. Yeah, well, we're doing it across the board. Go ahead, Zach. I think we we had a few comments. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So, so we've had a few comments about how we need to really up our game in terms of our communication, and I absolutely agree with those. I think you know we've certainly had some just straight up you know six you know comments in 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 favor of the six percent. I think we've also had a number of comments that I think are reacting to the numbers but aren't aware of what's in them. And what I'm specifically referring to are the people who say do the 6%, but don't use fund balance. And we've heard a bunch of that. And so I think I think there is also an opportunity there to really go out and talk to people, explain what we what we did and why, and to say, you know, you know yes, we, we heard you. We heard that we need to really cut this down. We also heard you say, we're, you know, we don't think it's responsible to use all this fund balance. What got us to the 6% was a whole bunch of the fund balance that you didn't want us to spend. And so that's, you know, yeah, it's, it's definitely going to be a bunch of work for us to do to really get that message out and get that message crisp and clear. But that that's where where I where I am less worried about being at the eight percent and and needing and being able to sell it. Yeah, and I agree with Zach that if we are able, and you can go next, Chris, if we are able to to to, move to, men. to approve, hold a minute, approve. Uh, just let me finish. What? If we if we're able to approve a budget, wait, wait, it, I can move to amend the motion. Let her finish. Just let me finish. I was just not I, done. For, can you hear me? Oh, I, can I? I well, it's so, so can you hear me, Michaela? It's yeah. It's hard for me to hear. Okay. So what I was just saying, it, following what Zach was saying, is that if we right now are able to agree in a budget, vote in the motion of the 8%, we can move and really, you know, split ourselves up to mobilize and inform our community and be able to all move to pass our budget, be able to have a postcard ready to send, be able to have a flyer, frequently asked questions, like really spend some time talking about how we're going to pass this budget together. So if we could move if if we can spend more time in that part right now so let's try to finish this deliberation 
Go ahead, Chris. So I have a motion to amend, uh, move to amend the uh, current. Sorry, thank you. I'm going to move to amend the current pending motion um, to um, accept the cuts in the 6%, um, but then restore the nursing and counseling in Doty and Callis. That is my motion to amend the currently current pending motion. So taking the adding cuts from the 6%, the buildings and ground and the two ESP positions that are unfilled, and then restoring the uh, 0.9 nurse with Callis and Doty and the 0.8 counselor at Callis and Doty. That motion, we need a second, that amendment. I'll second it. Okay. Okay, so we have an amendment by Chris, second by Michaelin. Is there any discussion or people are ready to vote? Can you clarify? Yeah, yeah. I, I, it's not my vote. Sure, no. Do you mean you wanted land, you want the net of that to be eight, or are you saying six? It, no, I'm not saying six. So you're Take saying just the eight from six. and moving the cut. Correct. Thank you. That's all. Right. I just wanted to know. And And not the fund balance from six? No. Absolutely not okay. balance from six. And then do you know what the money in, money out the is? Difference, it's I think the um money out would be about two fifty. Can we have Suzanne do that yeah. for us? It it's a new number. It's a new number of forty one million six hundred forty thousand three hundred forty eight dollars. And it actually is still six percent because it's a percentage thing. I'm not messing with the numbers, I swear. <laughs> wait, 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 wait. No, no. Essentially, Chris's motion gives you a 6% budget. But he's uh, adding I, I the allied not. arts. I hope not. He's adding wait, wait, the allied arts again. I added the added uh, buildings it. and grants. It's $110,460. The two ESP positions of 143. 674 and the total there is 255 134 and then adding back in uh the nurse for um Dodie and Callis and that's the 92674 plus the counselor at 87 uh 848 and that's a total of 18522 so there's a net reduction um additional reduction of about $75,000 or so. You wanted the fund balance in there? No. Not no. the 800. No, the, the regular 800. Fund, the fund balance is connected to the 8%. So he wants to use the 480, the 485. Yeah. Yeah. Caroline? I just want to make sure with Chris's, he realizes there's still going to be nurse, and they actually are adding back at some schools, but not all. The eight Correct. Is about to be point two nurse. Just making sure you were. That's in the eight percent. Yeah. Well, it's. I un, 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 um, it was specific to Dodi and uh, House. Yes. <laughs> this is a motion to amend the current uh, it's, it's to include but which would but, be a reduction. But that was what you thought you meant to move the fund balance. Right. He's recalculating what that number will be because the fund balance is not being used. It's listed in the six percent. Right. It's okay. Just the, for now, let's just try to get the number. And I, I also wanna the, just as discussion, just reminded us that we we looked at the equitable distribution of resources, and I know that that's not what everybody's thinking right now, but the, in the current, we were trying to make it so that it's more equitable across students and, and staff. So this would undo that. Uh, Ursula? To Floor's point, can Chris discuss how he thinks that these 
adjustments that you're making will affect the schools and the entire system? The entire system? Yes, within the pillars that we asked them to explore when making the budgets. It would certainly help two of our schools uh, that uh, would have uh, their current level of nursing and counseling maintained. Um, and certainly that would be a help for the students in those schools, I, I think you would agree. Um, and that has a ripple effect across the, the district because if they're down a nurse and counselors, um, does the district just ignore the needs then in those two schools? Or do resources come from other places um, to address those those needs? And we had a doctor saying, you know, if you have a kid who gets hurt, like telemedicine is great for some things, probably not really great for young kids. Uh, and, you know, there's, there's using the resources we have in the way that makes most sense within the circumstances of, and again, young kids. So that's, that's where I think it's beneficial uh, effect without being a negative to the district as a whole, because this actually lowers the budget by $75,000. Is it equitable? Of course it is. Can you define but, equitable? But is it going to be? It's not, but right. it's not equitable. It's still cut. And Romney's nurse, and Romney's had a 1.0 all along. And they're still, you're, right? So you're increasing. So you and Romney's bigger that. than both Callis and Doty. Does that mean Callis and Doty shouldn't have? And I'm not saying they shouldn't, but. With Where's it, the equity it, to, to I'll, Rumney I'll as well? Restore the point two for the Rumney well, nurse I, too, and then we'll reduce but, we'll reduce the overall benefit to the budget. Well, and equitable does not mean equal. It means giving each school what they need. And Worcester is the lowest socioeconomic um, town in our district, which does not always carry a heavier burden for mental health, but. Um, certainly isn't where we, I would recommend making the cuts. Susan, do you have yeah. I have a number, <laughs> not including the Romney nurse. So. Okay. <laughs> uh, it's a $41,640,348 budget. Which is a seven point seven six percent increase. So lower than eight percent. Yep. Okay. Yep. Um, so I'm going to move to amend my amendment to include the Romney nurse, which adds another twenty two thousand sixteen dollars. If we have a second. <laughs> Uh, do you have a second? I'll second it just for okay. Forty one million six hundred sixty two thousand three hundred sixty four dollars, and it's a seven point eight three percent increase. Seven point what? I'm sorry. Eight three percent. Thank you. So now they each have one FTE. Correct. To add point. Yeah, for nurse. Okay. For nurse. Yeah. Okay. Are we ready to call the question on the amendment? Oh yeah, go ahead, Joshua. Hey, Joshua, Joshua. I was just going to call a question on the amendment. That's all. Okay, thank so we you. We can Joshua. vote on Chris's amendment. Okay. All those in favor of the amendment? Uh, do anybody needs to be read again? The complicated amendment, or are you ready to vote on the second amendment by? Chris to include also the Romney nurse. All those in favor, please signify by saying, well, I think I'm just gonna make a roll call to mm -hmm. make it faster. So, or well, maybe not faster. Let's do a voice call first. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any, uh, all of those opposed, please say nay. 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 Okay, that's gonna be complicated. So, Amelia. Yeah. Nay. Nay. Chris? Aye. McKaylin? Aye. Natasha? Aye. Daniel? Nay. Michelle? Nay. Jonathan? Aye. Zach? Nay. Ursula? Nay. Keely? Um, I. 
Diane? Aye. Joshua? Nay. Just give me a minute. Okay. Yeah. 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 We have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven eyes. One, one, two, three, four, five, six. Nice. So the motion carries, but well, I haven't voted, so. Oh, the motion you have to amend. To amend, the motion to uh, amend carries. Okay, so now let's vote in the amended motion. Could you read the amended motion? Lisa. And could you could we just also cite the new percent right in the amendment? Yes. Or in the amended seven point eighty three is right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Everybody's clear. No. Sorry. Are we voting on the amendments or we're voting on the first it was with now. the amendment? Now the, the, that is the new motion. That is the new motion. That is yeah. New motion. So we are voting on the motion as amended. Okay. As amended. I was just kidding. Yeah. <laughs> Any questions? So I'm just going to go uh, around. I'm going to start here. Diane? Aye. Okay. Keely? Aye. Ursula? Nay. Zach? Aye. Jonathan? Aye. Michelle? Aye. Daniel? Aye. Natasha? Aye. McKaylin? Aye. Chris? Aye. Amelia? Aye. Joshua? Aye. the ice have it when can you read that dollar amount yeah for, for the, the, but the warning the warning for the warning 41 million six hundred sixty two thousand three hundred sixty four dollars which is a 7.83% local education spending increase. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you guys have the. But should we do the. Should we do the. The ballot? The, the the, the, yeah. Yeah, just the, the number. Ballot. Yeah. Our, but yeah, that's true. The warning is approved. Okay, so the yeah, just to make clear that everybody knows the warning is being is approved like that, and then we'll need the signature for everybody. 
Oh, the the warning is that this is a, this approves the warning. So this would be the warning for the vote. The amount that uh, Suzanne just read the six uh, was it forty forty one million six hundred twenty two with three three hundred sixty four dollars. Sixty two. Okay. There's and no need to approve the warning separately. Is what you're saying? Correct. Correct. And you will need to sign it once it's filled in because the one in your packet was didn't have a number. So yep. Melissa right. will have to reach out to folks about signing. Yeah. Okay. In probably pretty short order. Yes. Right now. Okay. So let's uh, let's move now into the budget communication. Yeah. 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 So we, the finance committee and the steering committee met this week in uh, to to try to come up with a, um, a budget outreach and communications plan. And there were a lot of ideas that floated uh, by by everybody there. So what we were hoping is that we would have. We've been working with Ben Miller, who's our uh, does our report and helped us put the postcard together. So we were hoping to have a, we will a, have a multi-page, a, a flyer like we had, a trifold like we had the, the last time, but have it be two pages so we can include more information there. The, a, so the introductory message, the overview of the budget, the tax rate projections and frequently asked questions, we are still working on, on those and everybody's gonna contribute to that. It, the annual report will be also uh, posted and updated in the, in the website. We're not going to reprint the big annual report. We're going to have the annual report in the in the in the website. Uh, and we would like to have a standalone. And I'll let Megan talk about the frequently asked uh, asked questions in a minute. And the next the next part of it is that we're going to have the informational meeting, which we all agree to in April 17. And this is when we will be presenting the, it, we are trying to do it before everybody goes on vacation, right? So we would do this together and now we own the budget. So the board will be presenting uh, the budget. Yeah. And then the outreach meeting, We this is uh, an idea that the, the both the steering committee and the finance started at the finance committee uh, had is that maybe on May 1st, instead of, a, we were scheduled to have a meeting, we would uh, reschedule our quality committee meeting. And instead of that, we would have representation. So split the board into five, basically, and have a meeting in, but with representation across town. So not just Middlesex, mm -hmm. go to Middlesex and East Montpelier to East Montpelier. So we would have representation uh, and have the steering committee members that each one represents. That's one of the ideas that they could schedule a time or we can just, uh, split up in in five representational groups and that use that may first like a carousel kind of thing and we would facilitate a, a presentation of the budget by april 17 we would have talking points and we would have separated our roles um, so we would use that same information for each of us to go it doesn't have to be in the school if that community decides that the best place to meet is uh, I don't know the Wami bar. You know, like you, you tell me it can be the school. You decide. Um, we were thinking about an informational video that could be in the website, so it's just it runs the budget and just have a short presentation of the budget, and then you know still try to do our best with the social the social media and other ideas. But before we do other ideas, I wanted Megan to talk a little bit about the frequently asked questions. Really, just look for, for the board's input. The I, concept is that that we would just have an available frequently asked questions space on our website. We would also push it out so that people are seeing it. This in the printout are just some ideas from questions that we know people have asked in the community. I'm not asking you to answer them. We'll answer them. We want to make sure we have all the questions. So. We know that people want to know about income sensitivity and they want to know not only what that looks like, but also how would they access that? Suzanne has some good information about that. So we will have that in there. Um, obviously, um, just sort of that general question, if the budget's going up by 
whatever percent, how come my tax rate is different from that? So basically just information about why that is, um, how can I better understand our funding system? Obviously an explanation of the reductions, um, including where they come from and functional area. Uh, why can't consolidation be considered for FY25? That's a question that comes up. So we know that these are questions and we'll include those. What other questions have board members heard that you think this document should include? Two possibility. One is uh, it was very helpful to see that per pupil cost. Um, and so I think, is there a way to um, uh, have that as what does this mean per pupil mm -hmm. and that? The other thing is what is the impact of using fund balance? Because I know that's a big question that's out there. Go ahead, McKaylin. I think Keely mentioned including what the tax rate increase would be on the level. Because mm -hmm. I don't think many people understood that taxes were What was the last part of what you just said? I want to make sure. I was just saying the people I've spoken to didn't really understand the first time around that taxes are going up significantly, kind of regardless of what happens with the budget. Mm -hmm. So that would be helpful. Any other ideas? You can you can email you can Jack email us. You, you oh, Zach, sorry, I didn't see your hand. I th this is related to B, B, and I think also related to McHalen's point. But I think it's important to have something to walk people through what the different components are. So, like you going from the actual total increase, which is actually less than the you know the seven point eight selling percent that we've been talking about to net ed spending, to what does that mean per pupil, to, to then sort of what is the bottom line impact on the tax rate just from the ed spending, and to then be able to speak to what impact does the property values have on it so that people can sort of get, you can people sort of take people through it step by step so that they you know, can feel like they can get some grasp of the complexity. Is this still only about the... Uh, um... Well, any but other you, any yeah. other ideas? If you're done with, you're done with the question. So the ideas of communicate. Uh, hold on a minute, Daniel. Um, I think it's. I think we have to balance, uh, the amount of of information we give with people, the the necessary amount of information we give, and what might overwhelm voters. So I think we need to be careful. I don't have a I don't have an answer to how to do that, so I'm sorry. That's not helpful. Maybe. Um, Can I respond to that real real quick? Sure. Um, I totally agree. I have some colleagues outside, as you know, lots of districts are selling their budgets right now, who have really good plain language answers to these questions at a readability rate that's very accessible. And so we're gonna. I'm borrowing a lot of their phrasing because. Even Zach, what you asked as a follow-up is really complex. So I have some good ideas. I can't say it will be perfect, but I do think plain language is really important. This is complicated and I'd rather make it simpler and understandable than get in the weeds. Someone can always ask for follow-up. We can always bring someone into the weeds if they wanna go there, but will this document will be aimed to be really accessible. And we the can other, have the other point. Sorry, was in the in the budget mailing C tax rate projections. I think for me, I guess I'll say the one point four six dollars per whatever is less helpful than the percent increase. Yeah. By town. And then we would have a, in the mailer. We would send some of the frequently asked questions, and then we can have a longer document that is in the website. So to that end, so one of the things we've heard in multiple places um, at the meetings and that is basically the, the frequency. So like wondering about more frequent postings in front porch forum, they might be shorter, but it's really the information to get out there. Um, the other thing that um, Keely and I were hearing over the weekend was, I, I think this is a lot of pressure on our our principals to be talking with staff about this, um, who are community members as well. And I'm not sure how we as a board help with that in terms of being the front facing 
of um, while, you know, we realize the cut, I don't know what that looks like, but I'm just thinking that we as a board need to take that on as opposed to our principals having to go in um, and shore up their staff while also um, talking up this budget that could be very painful and stressful. And so, so that's another thing. And, and then the other, what we also, what I heard from somebody was that, um, you know, now we, we have had the discussion, we have had um, the discord. Now is our time to move forward as a unified board to really sell this and, and get it out there. Yeah. Amelia. I'm curious along the lines of um, kind of emphasizing the contribution of the increases to the CLA and the property values, people might be left sort of feeling like, well, what can you, like, why don't you do more, <laughs> you know, um, or sort of like, well, what do we do with this frustration? Mm -hmm. um, and there might be questions about like, how do we, um, what, what impact can we make? And I'm wondering as a board, if we could have sort of agreed upon language that we could use to and, and yeah. even resources to refer people to if they wanted to get involved in like advocating uh, for changes on the state level mm -hmm. or even at the national level and sort of like agreeing on how we refer people to get involved with the policy that they want to be yeah, two two answers. One is the 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 further explanation about Vermont's ed funding system is where we would connect them to different resources, different ways to learn about why it is and all of that. And I would also say um, it's pretty easy to add a link to your legislators. I mean, just today, I sat in front of the Senate Finance Committee. We had a conversation with the Ways and Means. So there is a ton of advocacy, and I think this board is quite well represented in that. And we can maybe talk about that in our FAQ. Not only give people the resource, but also let them know that we're trying. The hard part is the universal answer is it's not going to be fixed for this year. That's the hard part. Yeah. But still, good suggestion. Thank you. Any other? I think maybe just... Just to echo Diane about moving forward as a board and also frequency, I think in the communications material, it'd be really great to have like, if you have one sentence, this is what you say. If you have three sentences, this is what you say. If you have a paragraph, this is what you say. Because the more that we can talk about this as a unified board and the more this message can kind of stick in the heads of people as they hear it more and more and it's the same thing, I think the more likely we are to get people out to vote and that people are going to vote with us. So this answer connects that with also the social media frequency. I would recommend that the board, and right now it could be the steering committee because you don't have an active communications committee. I think the board would need to organize itself around this. I think if we leave today with just, we're going to do more frequent social media posts, or there's three different versions of the messages, I think it will get lost. My suggestion would be whether that is a short meeting or a, I, I think you will, you'll want to organize yourselves a little bit. So you, who's doing which front post porch forum and when, who's, you know, that type of thing. So can we form an, or I don't know if there's a, so there's a steering committee or. There's a, a steering, uh, there's a steering committee. We can have the steering committee, uh, the steering committee meet. I think we can't quite wait for the steering committee to meet before putting it, you know, I, I would write an update of today that the steering committee should post, right? And mm -hmm. uh, at least just for, for, for today and then have a meeting of the, of the steering, the steering committee just to go through all of the other all of the other parts. And then I, I agree with you, Kelly, like having some talking points uh, for everybody to have the same, especially when we go to each of our communities all, all separate. And then we would still need to partner because as board members, we can say vote yes, you know, and I hope that everybody understands that, right? We are, we, we can give information and ask people to come to vote. It could be parents and other people can go out and say, please vote yes for the board. So you would need the partnership of of other of, of other people but i think if we are at the forefront of putting information out and communicating uh, when the vote is and reminding people to go and vote this is a special it's not when people regularly vote right so maybe just i would love to be a part of that so yeah. Diane just said that yeah. i can so step in for her on. or i don't yeah. know if we can both yeah that would be, it or well, like, so yeah you guys could switch I, yeah it'd be great to. 
Uh, Michaelen? I'm just curious, does, I know we have front porch forum, but does the district have Facebook and Instagram accounts? And if so, yes, we, we the district that certainly does. Oh. We do not have an Instagram post. We have a Facebook post and the district gets four or five front porch forum posts per month because of our account. So we do use those and push them out. The I would offer that the board needs to lead in addition to that, mm -hmm. particularly because you also want to network with community members who can who can help you ne network so that. So board, Instagram and board, Facebook. I think we just use our personal ones, right? Mm -hmm. No? Yes, no, no. We can't. <laughs> Well, you as individual community members, and I would say anyone who knows anyone in a school and is friends with them on Facebook, I, I see lots of administrators saying, please vote my vote, like as a citizen, please vote for my budget. So, right. So, yes, people can as individuals. Um, whether or not I would want, I would think you would want your, you would want to think about whether or not the board wants a Facebook and Instagram page, because you would want to think about who monitors it and who sets it up and I mean, we even so. The district, if we have Facebook, at least get Instagram. We can't right now because the Facebook page is—it's a little complicated. So don't don't think we haven't tried that. It's really hard to get it. It's it was created under a previous employee. Facebook locks it down. You then anyway, it's complicated. More complicated than you would think. Yeah. And what gets and you know I I'm hesitant to put a board. Uh, Facebook account because the other districts have got in trouble with it. with that is really hard to manage. But you with your own individual account, you can always repost what is posted on the district account. And that's what most of us do. So like for example, Melissa posts there's a board meeting, repost that there's going to be a board meeting. There's a board vote. You know, you don't, you know, you can say please, you know, and then your friends will will see that. Ursula. I was going to say, um, I also take the district ones and share it to like Middlesex as a Middlesex families group. Um, I'm blanking exactly on the name. I'm pretty sure Worcester has something like a community group on Facebook. I haven't checked all of our towns to be fair, but I will take any of the district posts and share them over. And if sometimes when I do it for mobile, it gets wonky. So then I just cut and paste. Okay. So I'm going to move us uh, along in the interest of getting us out of here, hopefully before nine o'clock. Uh, we need to appoint uh, 4.3, uh, appoint a board member to the uh, interview committee for the U32 principal. So who's interested? Uh, Michelle? Yeah. Yeah. I'd be interested in it. You'd be interested in it. Anybody else that would be interested in it? What, how many do you want? No, I'm just asking one. So I'm just asking, yeah, to have kid. Amelia, you'd be interested too. Okay, so you what? I'd be interested. So if you guys check the first. dates, uh, yeah. How about I send the dates to all three of you, and if who, and we'll start with who can. I don't want to be the yeah. one to pick you, but yeah, I mean, throw my name. Okay. So I will send the dates to the three interested folks, and it it is something where we would need you to be involved in all of them. So yeah. if they if you're not available, that would pull you out of the mix. Yeah. And then I will ask. I, I I don't know how you want to pick from there, but we'll take it from there. Well, I think if from there, you, you know, they, just like everybody, if it works for the three for the for the three of us, I would just let the consultant pick from the three board map because I don't know how. Text. That's true. She has not. So I, I, I think the easiest way would just be to have yeah. one person. Yeah, yeah. But I'll step down. I mean, never yeah, mind. I mean, you guys can battle it. Yeah. <laughs> no, what? Was... what did you say, Amelia? I wasn't sure if you needed multiple people, right? But if you just one. Just one. Things. Okay. So could I have a motion? Okay. So we're going with Michelle. Michelle. No, unless Michelle can't. Just you, Michelle. No, I have, you I have saw the dates. I can take. You saw the dates? I don't know what the dates are, but I have time I can take, so I'm not worried about it. So we're going with Michelle. There okay. we go. Woo okay, so right. can somebody make a motion? I make a motion. Okay, Diane makes a motion and Ursula seconds it. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Right. Any opposed? Hearing none, the motion carries. Thank you. Okay, if we're not quite done. If personnel. 
page 12 to have a volunteer. Yeah. Ursula. I move to accept the resignations of Jessica Wills, assistant principal, and Carol Holden, director of special services, with many thanks for their service. Second. So moved by Ursula and second by Natasha. Thank you, Jess and Kara. We were going to miss you. Okay, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any? Oh, can we vote no? Any? <laughs> can we kidnap them and hide yeah, in our dungeon? Yeah, just I know, clone them. Okay. Any opposed? I assume none. Any abstentions? Okay, the motion carries. Okay. So, okay. consent agenda. Approve the minutes that we didn't approve the last time. So could I have a motion to approve the minutes? So moved. Okay, so moved by Chris, second by McKellen. All those in favor, please signify. Oh, any discussion? All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Hearing none, the motion carries. Okay, future agenda items is pass our budget. <laughs> no, I well, like work on passing our budget. <laughs> uh, Daniel. One thing that came up in the steering committee after you left was board vacancies. I want to. Um, yeah, that's the that's the other one. So now that we have the budget, we're gonna post. Uh, Melissa has already contacted the town clerks, and we're just gonna ask for letters of recommendation. We have somebody interest from Dallas, and we still need to find somebody from from Doty, from Worcester. Okay, and a motion to adjourn. Second. Daniel, and second by Natasha. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Good evening.